July 18th, 2023. The open gate submarine Titan makes its descent into the unwelcoming waters of the Titanic. And only a few hours later, creator Stockton Rush was killed when his own creation imploded. Welcome to inventors killed by their own inventions. Sabine Arnold von Sashaki was born in Ukraine in 1883 and was a prominent chemical scientist and inventor in the early 20th century. He moved to the US in 1906, where he later started the United States Radium Corporation in 1917. This was the first company to produce radioluminescent paint in the US. Sashaki had discovered a way to extract radium and use it to create a glowing paint that he saw as the future, which he called Undark. The United States Radium Corporation was a major supplier of luminous watches to the military during World War I, and Sashaki was reaping in the rewards. However, he would soon be faced with the consequences of his actions. His workers were dying. For years, his employees had been ingesting this paint as they placed the brushes in their mouth to form a point. These women were not given the necessary safety precautions to be handling the materials, and were instead told that it was safe. However, they would stand up against Sashaki, fighting him in court. They were aptly named the Radium Girls, and sadly, they would all succumb to the radiation, but not after playing an important role in developing workers' rights. Sabine Arnold von Sashaki came down with the same illness in 1925, and only three years later he would meet the same fate. November 14th, 1928, at the age of 45 at his house in East Orange, New Jersey, the radiation had taken his fingers and teeth and was now about to take the rest of him. This should be a cautionary tale to not mess around with things that we do not completely understand. To this day, the graves of the Radium Girls are still radioactive. The year is 1920. And brothers Fred and August Duesenberg found Duesenberg Automobile and Motors Company Incorporated in Indianapolis, Indiana. A relatively small car manufacturing company, they still managed to have some success with their models. The Model A was their first mass-produced vehicle and featured many innovations to the cars of the past. These included an overhead camshaft, four-valve cylinder heads, and the first four-wheel hydraulic brakes offered on a passenger car. Furthermore, it had the largest engine of any consumer vehicle at the time of its production. And while the company wasn't very successful financially, the brothers were talented engineers and had an eye for innovation, especially when it came to performance and racing. In 1921, Jimmy Murphy drove a Duesenberg race car to become the first American car to win the prestigious Grand Prix at Le Mans, France. They would also see many other successes in the racing scene throughout the years. During the 1920s, the company would produce several other models with varying success. The later Model J being one of the company's most prominent contribution to the automotive industry, being extremely popular amongst the wealthy. However, Fred's drive for speed and performance would eventually lead him to his demise. On July 2nd, 1932, while returning to Indianapolis from New York, Fred was driving a Duesenberg passenger car with a prototype high-powered engine and lost control of it on a wet Lincoln Highway on Ligonier Mountain, about two miles west of Jennerstown, Pennsylvania. Duesenberg's automobile overturned, throwing him from the car. But somehow he wasn't killed. In fact, he was hospitalized and said to make a full recovery. However, fate had already made his decision. Fred Duesenberg developed pneumonia and sadly died July 26, 1932 at the age of 55. This is the AVE Mizar. It is a Frankenstein-like mix of a Ford Pinto and a Cessna Skymaster, and it was supposed to be the world's first flying car. 
It was designed by aerospace engineers Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake, who were both graduates of Northrop Institute of Technology's Aeronautical Engineering School. And in 1971, they founded Advanced Vehicle Engineers, or AVE for short. They had worked for over two years and created two prototypes of the Mizar. It worked by modifying a Pinto to have extra controls for flying a plane, which would be attached to the back of the car at an airport. One prototype was on display at the Galpin Ford dealership, while the second was unveiled to the press on May 8, 1973. Both vehicles were photographed by Peterson publishing photographer Mike Brenner for Hot Rog magazine in August. It's safe to say the media was loving this car. They were excited to see these be released to the public. However, a dazzling concept could only get you so far. They had to prove that the Mizar would really work. So they ran some tests. The first test flight was at the Camarillo Airport in California on August 26, 1973 by professional pilot Charles Janice. And shockingly, it actually took off. It was incredible. All their hard work and calculations had paid off. However, it was short-lived. According to Janice, the part of the plane that mounted the base of the right wing onto the car had failed. And this caused him to immediately land the Mizar, a foreshadowing that the team would devastatingly ignore. This put a dent into the Mizar's reputation. However, they still managed to receive a reported 34 pre-orders for it before the fateful day. September 11, 1973, during a test flight at Camarillo, the same right wing mount detached from the car. However, it wasn't Janice in the driver's seat. It was the founders. While the reports vary, it is said that the car plummeted after detaching from the wings. Smolinski and the vice president of AVE, Harold Blake, were killed in the resulting crash. And just like that, our dreams of flying cars were destroyed in the blink of an eye. Lighthouses have been around for a while, with the oldest lighthouse dating back to around 20 BC. And up until the 1700s, all of them were built on land. However, one man changed that when he built the first lighthouse that was completely exposed to the open sea. His name was Henry Winstanley. Henry decided to build a lighthouse because he had noticed that two of his ships had wrecked in the same spot on the Eddystone Rocks. Furious, he asked why nothing was done to protect these ships from the obvious hazard, and Henry was told that the reef was too dangerous to build anything there. He took this as a challenge and set out to build a lighthouse that would protect future ships from the rocks. Construction started July 14, 1696, but due to some setbacks, the final lighthouse was not finished until November 1698. And even then, the lighthouse had some flaws, so he decided to build it once again, this time even larger than the last. It was a beautiful creation, and when Stanley believed it to be one of the best, in fact, he was so confident about his creation that he decided to stay in it during one of the worst storms in British history. The Great Storm of 1703, which caused over 8,000 people to lose their lives, was approaching. And the lighthouse was no match. It was destroyed and everybody inside of it, including Henry, died. His creation collapsing on top of him. Newspapers all around France are showing only one thing. A man plummeting to his death off the side of the Eiffel Tower. This man was no other than Franz Reichelt, or as he is now known, the Flying Tailor. Born October 16, 1878 in Austria-Hungary, he moved to France in 1898, becoming a successful tailor in the area. But Reichelt had bigger dreams. He was fascinated with early parachute designs and set out to make his own that would be suitable for low altitude jumps starting in 1910. His early tests on dummies proved successful. However, it was all downhill from here. His suit designs were failing miserably. 
His original suit weighed around 70 kilograms, and when he presented it to La Ligue Aérienne, he was dismissed quickly. Reichelt would continue working on his design and doing more tests. In a cruel way of foreshadowing, he had already flirted with death on more than one occasion. During one test, his suit failed to protect him from a 10 meter jump and he narrowly escaped by landing on a pile of straws. The second time, Reichelt wasn't so lucky. Jumping from a height of 8 meters once again, the suit did nothing to slow his fall and he suffered a broken leg on impact. Franz Reichelt was determined to keep going. Finally, February 1912, Franz Reichelt was given permission to undertake his biggest jump of his life, jumping off of the Eiffel Tower. Sunday, February 4th at 7 a.m., Reichelt arrives at the tower wearing his suit. With his friends begging him not to jump, he makes his way up to the lower platform. He wasn't going to listen to anyone. He was confident and smiled before making the jump. At 8.22 a.m., Reichelt placed one foot out, waited a few moments, and then jumped. The crowd stood in shock as his suit wrapped around him and he plummeted more than 57 meters to the ground. Stockton Rush and his four other passengers die instantly. But let's go back a bit. Richard Stockton Rush was born on March 31st, 1962. And all throughout his childhood, he was fascinated with exploration, both of the ocean and air. He attended Princeton and Berkeley, graduating in 1989, and would work in many different positions until 2006, when he would go on his first submarine trip. This was a changing point in his life as he grew fascinated with underwater exploration. He quickly realized that he wouldn't be able to purchase one of these vessels, so instead he sought to build one. Rush built a small submarine using Navy submarine blueprints that could dive up to a depth of 10 meters. However, the business side of Rush started to take over as he thought of monetizing underwater travel. This led to the creation of Ocean Gates in 2009 alongside Guillermo Sonlien. Originally, they rented out submersibles to use on tours, and they were successful. But over time, Stockton Rush wanted to create his own, more cost-effective vessels. This led to the creation of the Cyclops, and eventually their biggest submarine, the Titan. These trips were mostly successful, and by 2023, he had made at least 13 successful trips to the Titanic. And while there were some concerns of safety by other members of the community, Rush pushed on. And so on the 18th of June, 2023, at 9.30 a.m., the final expedition to the Titanic went ahead. Everything was going fine. The submarine had successfully lowered itself into the water. That was until close to two hours later. The submarine would implode. Choosing to ignore all safety measures instead of a safe submersible for tourism, Stockton Rush made a glorified wet casket for himself and the four others in the vessel. There's a limit. You know, at some point, safety just is pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed. Don't get in your car. Don't do anything. At some point, you're going to take some risk. And it really this has been inventors killed by their own inventions. Thank you for watching.